Hi, thanks for waking up uh, and trekking through the rain. Uh, yeah, so what I'll talk about today is doing work with Jian Ding and Yuval Paris. It was, it was done mostly in Seattle, where it's actually a beautiful sunny day today. Uh, at least according to the, my security camera. Uh, okay, so actually I want to talk about work that's, uh, that we did a few years ago. Uh, but the reason I'm going to talk about it is because, uh, uh, well, for some reason, uh, okay, pe people in this program should know about it, but uh, uh, they still seem uh, not to. So, for instance, Oleg talked yesterday, I mean, a few days ago, about random spanning trees uh, and sort of the cover time barrier to uh, getting a near linear time algorithm for, uh, for uh, random spanning trees sampling. Uh, okay, but I mean, today we'll see some things which are sort of relevant to the fact that that barrier doesn't really exist. And uh, also, I guess Richard, uh, in the last workshop, talked about joint work with Dan on, uh, on, on sampling from the Gaussian free field in, in parallel time, but without using the words Gaussian free field. So, uh, okay, so. That must not have been me. What's that? That must not have been me. No, that was, that was Richard. Uh, oh. What's that? That was with Chapa and uh, Yan Liu and. Oh, I see. My apologies. Sorry. Uh, but the comment still stands. <laughs> okay, uh, so one question we can ask is what, I mean, what do we expect spectral graph theory to be good for? And, and one thing we all know it's good for is if, if you have some kind of operator, like a heat flow operator, a random walk on a graph, uh, and you want to look at the sort of the long time behavior of that operator, then obviously the thing to do is diagonalize it. Uh, you look at it in the, in the spectral basis, and uh, and then you can see lots of things, how, how fast it converges to uniform, things that stop it from spreading out in the material. I actually have now, as Dan pointed out, this is a, this is a touch. See, we'll see if this works. Oh, okay. So like here's a, this is a, a body with some uh, initial heat uh, configuration, and then, you know, okay, this is the heat flow in the torus, all right? But uh, the point is that, aside from the mouse pointer, uh, you know, the, we're, nobody's surprised that, uh, that spectral graph theory has something to say about this process. Right. Hopefully at this point we're not surprised. Uh, okay. Okay, so how much can you say? I mean, you know, spectral graph theory is not magic, so you can't say anything you want. Um, I mean, the, the alternate title of this talk could be spectral graph theory is magic. But, uh, so I mean, suppose you wanted to, I, instead of considering sort of the bulk behavior of the heat flow, just consider the trajectory of one particle. Okay, so like just random walk uh, on a graph. It doesn't make sense that, that that sort of spectral method should let you say something specific about this one trajectory. Okay, I mean it doesn't make sense for lots of reasons, but just like from a physical perspective, if you think about the way heat disperses as sort of like tiny vibrations, you know, uh, giving small amounts of energy to nearby particles, then there's sort of uh, anonymity. Like if two particles bump into each other somewhere, their histories don't matter. How they go off from there is sort of you know, you don't name the particles and then keep track of your favorite ones. So, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm, I was uh, expecting maybe some objections here, but if there are none, I'll keep going. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so, you know, suppose we wanted to say something about a single trajectory. Okay, in some sense, that's an embarrassing question because, like, uh, you know, spectral methods shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be able to talk about such things. Okay, so let me now say, uh, give a specific question about considering a single kind of trajectory, and that's, uh, about the cover time of a graph. Okay, so we have a graph G, W is the random walk on G, and uh, this random time tau cub is the first time at which, you know, you start the random walk, it visits many vertices. This is a random time, it's the first time at which every vertex of G has been visited. Okay. So we're really keeping track of one particle, waiting until it has seen every single vertex. And then we stop, that's tau cub. And then the cover time is just the expected value of tau cub. Okay? Except for the fact that there's a, we didn't specify the initial vertex for the walk. So by convention, although you'll see it won't matter too much, we'll take the starting vertex to be the, the sort of the worst one, the one from which the expected time to cover is the, is the largest. Okay, so this is the cover time of a graph. And uh, I mean, already you can see that this is a bit of a subtle parameter. So for instance, for the complete graph, you know, the random walk mixes in one step. Uh, but if you want to cover the graph, it takes n log n steps. This is just coupon collecting. I mean, uh, you know, after n steps, naively you expect to, you should have seen everyone in expectation, but of course to, to really get the last guy is very tricky to visit the last one. So you bid this extra log n to do that. Uh, 
And then, I mean, you can also just consider sort of the opposite end of the spectrum, which is the n cycle. So there, the cover time is about n squared, which is on the order of the, of the mixing time. So sort of, uh, you know, sort of like th there you cover about the same time that you mix. Here, here you mix in one step, and it takes you a very, very long time to cover. And in general, you can think about graphs which are, you know, various uh, combinations of these graphs at, at uh, different scales, and you get some kind of complicated behavior. Okay. So, uh, okay, so there are many things known. This parameter was studied uh, for quite a long time. So, for instance, uh, as Oleg pointed out, you missed my comment about you in the introductory remarks. You'll have to ask someone else about it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the, the cover time is always bounded by twice the number of edges times the number of vertices. And uh, Feige showed that uh, for any connected graph, uh, sort of, uh, it always takes at least n log n time to cover the graph. So here are some generic bounds. And let me just mention two questions that indicate, at least uh, up to a few years ago, some, some, uh, some gaps in our understanding of cover time. So there is a question of Aldous and Phil from the, from the 90s, which just asks, uh, okay, so certainly I can compute the cover time of a graph just by simulating the random walk. We saw in the previous slide that you, you know, it takes uh, at most n cubed steps uh, in expectation, so we simulate the random walk and we output, you know, okay, do it 10 times, take the, take the median or the average of, uh, of the cover times, and you can output this as a, an approximation for the cover time. But you can ask if you can do it deterministically. So in fact, like most classical parameters of the random walk, it was known, I mean, it's, it's not hard to see that you can sort of compute them deterministically. Uh, but this one, this one sort of uh, appeared to be more difficult. Okay, so this is one question that uh, they asked. And uh, here's, a, here's a question of Winkler and Zuckerman, which is, uh, uh, so if you look at this coupon collecting problem on the complete graph, so you're just doing random walk on the complete graph, then, uh, okay, so it takes you n log n steps before you see every vertex. But then if you go another, you know, say n log n steps, actually you've seen every vertex uh, a proportional number of times. Every vertex has been visited log n times after, say, two n log n steps. Okay? So what they conjecture is that actually this is just true for every graph. For every graph, uh, if you go to the cover time and then go a bit more, not only do you cover all the vertices, but you cover them equitably. So here it says it's sort of like, you know, the blanket time is the first random time t such that every vertex has been visited, say, half as much as it should have been visited according to the stationary measure at that vertex. Okay? So they conjecture that, uh, these two, you know, if you go if you go until you cover, then a little bit further, and you actually uh, cover the graph right, sort of uh, uniformly. Okay, so those are two two questions. Uh, okay, yeah. So at this point, uh, I wanted to give. Okay, so now the second, uh, like more impressive. Uh, okay. okay. Here is uh, there is some kind of scaling issue, which is why these numbers are on top of each other. Okay. So here we're just watching the random walk cover the torus, just like as a yeah. Can you compute mixing time in deterministic? Depends what you mean by mixing time. But since you can compute all the eigenvalues. Yeah, but the log n? Well, you can compute all, it depends what you mean by the mixing time, but you can compute all the eigenvalues. I mean, yes, you can just power the adjacency matrix for using repeated squaring. And then you see what the distribution is. So, uh, okay, we're covering the torus here. It's actually going very fast. My computer is very fast today. Uh, wow, this is incredibly fast. Maybe I was downloading updates all night. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, but you see, it's like very. Now we have one vertex left to cover. I don't know where it is. It's somewhere in here. Uh, but the point is, it's a. Uh, okay, we didn't. You know, if, if you if you watch the whole thing while I was talking, you see that the, you know sort of the, the way in which you cover the torus is actually quite complicated. And uh, what happens is sort of uh, sometimes actually don't make any progress, and then sometimes you get to an area you haven't visited before, and you cover an entire clump. And then at the very end of the process, you have a few stragglers. And it's taking you, you know, some time to go around and collect them. Okay, so that was uh, that's just a picture of the cover. <coughs> what does the coloring mean? Yeah. Ah, sorry. The yeah, the co the coloring is just proportional to the number of times it was visited. So another thing that happens here is that at you know at the cover time, you know, so many guys were visited a few times. There are some hot spots of people who were visited many times. Uh, the conjecture of Winkler and Zuckerman says that if we ran this for 150,000 steps, then the color should be very uniform after we finish. Okay, so uh, I convinced you maybe that the cover time is a cool thing to study and uh, that, that maybe spectral techniques shouldn't have much to say about it. I don't know. Okay, so uh, fortunately for us, uh, uh, Dembo, Perez, Rosen, Zaytuni actually computed 
uh, like at least for the Taurus, the cover time uh, asymptotics exactly. Okay, so the cover time of so here little n is the side length, capital N is the number of vertices. So capital N is little n squared. Did I get it right, Yuval? I did, is it a half and you square and you divide by a two? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So so this is the the cover time of the of the capital N node Taurus. Uh, okay. Uh, I guess the, the pi is not, uh, you know, it's a torus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, if you, if, I, if you go to the MATLAB code where to, 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 where to produce the torus, there's a pi. So. <laughs> it's just too broad. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, this bound was conjectured before you proved it, right? So, I mean, the, it's, it's just conjectured by all this. Yeah, all this proved one side of the bound. Uh, the upper bound. Yes. It's always the easier side, so it must be now. Okay. Uh, not because all this only proves easy things, just because <laughs> the paper is, uh, has quite technical estimates uh, to prove this. Uh, okay, so uh, I don't know. Now let's just sort of blindly forge ahead and, uh, and uh, write down some spectral objects. Okay, so let's write down, let's, so L is the, is the Laplace energy. Just this, the, this is the diagonal degree matrix, this is the adjacency matrix of the graph G. And uh, Okay, everything except for the third line here is everybody is comfortable with. V1 through Vn are the eigenvectors of L. The only thing we need from this is that V1 is the, is the, is the constant eigenvector, and lambda 1 is equal to 0. Okay. And, uh, and then, in addition to these uh, spectral objects, we're gonna, we have a sequence of uh, n iid normal 0, 1 random variables. Okay. And so let's just write down a random sum. Here's a random sum. Okay. Uh, <coughs> You know, we're just going to push around symbols. So, they, I mean, yeah, I was working with like with David Storer last night, and he says, you know, we're just pushing around symbols. Okay, so that's what we're going to do now. Uh, okay, so this is a random sum where right the vi's are eigenvectors, the gi's are random normal zero one random variables, uh, and the, the lambda i's are the eigenvalues, and we we don't divide by zero because we only sum from two. That's a random sum. Okay, so let's uh, now just uh, take the maximum entry in that random sum. Okay, so this is a n-dimensional vector. Uh, we look at the maximum entry, let's square it, and multiply by the number of edges in the graph. You just, you know, these are all the things you know, so you just put all the, okay, so you put them all in a formula. Okay, and, uh, all right, that's a nice formula. Uh, okay, miraculously, uh, it turns out, so here, here I said equals, but I'll explain equals in a second because this is a random number. Uh, okay, but, uh, well, definitely the expected value of this thing is, uh, is equal to this, up to a little o of one factor. So this little o of one is something that goes to, goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And, uh, but also this is, this is very co highly concentrated, so sort of like the variance of this thing also fits inside the little o of one factor. So, so basically you do this random experiment, you'll get, a, you'll get a, a very nice estimation for the cover time. Okay? So this, you know, so now you're saying, well look, I'm not very surprised. You said you can't do it spectrally, uh, then you gave me the torus, which is this very symmetric object, and then you wrote down some formula. I mean, stuff like this happens all the time because you have tons of symmetries and so forth. But the amazing thing is that this phenomenon is true completely generally in, in any graph. Okay, so here's the theorem that we proved with uh, Jian and Yuval uh, a few years ago. So you take now any graph G, take the same setup as before. L is Laplacian, VIs are the eigenvectors, lambda i's are the eigenvalues. Uh, now compute this random vector, take the maximum entry, square it, and multiply by the number of edges in any graph. This uh, is proportional to the cover time up to some absolute constants. Okay. Yeah. Can you show that it actually there has to be some constant bigger than one? Okay, good question. All right, we'll, we'll come to this uh, momentarily. Yeah. Uh, so, but but uh, as long as you you want something of constant order, then sort of this kind of uh, yeah, seemingly miraculous at the moment, we're going to explain it. That's the point of the talk. Random experiment. By the way, it will still be miraculous at the end of the talk. I would say that it's still uh, no one quite really understands what's going on. Uh, yeah, so this, this is proportional to the cover time. And, uh, and one nice thing, okay, just let me just say for sort of computationally, you can sample from this, uh, from this sort of, uh, you can sample this random variable in near linear time using, I mean, it, this, this occurs in a paper of, uh, of uh, uh, Dan and uh, Nikhil. Uh, but basically, you can, yeah, you, there's, you can sample from this in near linear time using Laplacian system solvers. Okay, we'll see that in a second, that you can do that. So, uh, 
but just as an as a as a okay. It's not necessarily so impressive. We replace one random, you know, this is a this is a an expectation of a random quantity. This is an expectation of a random quantity, but this quantity has tons of structure. So, for instance, uh, you can use it to resolve these questions from before. So it says uh, uh, it gives you a deterministic algorithm for approximating the cover time simply because there you can get a deterministic algorithm. If I give you the vi's and lambda i's, you can get a deterministic algorithm to approximate uh, this infinity norm within a constant factor. And, uh, and also you have to see that it comes out from the proof, but once you have this set up, you can, you, can, uh, you can conclude that also the blanket time and cover time are within a constant factor. Okay, so you get some structural, I mean, you get some properties from this, not just sort of an amazing uh, coincidence of, of numbers. Okay, uh, oh yeah, and I should say that sort of, uh, yeah, the best previous bounds for both of these were log log n due to Kahn, Kim, Lovas, and Vu. So they gave a log log n approximation and they showed that these two things are within log log n factors for an n node graph. Uh, okay, but here we, here we get universal constants. Uh, okay, so now uh, to, to Alex's question, is the constant bigger than one? Or maybe it's uh, really uh, only one. So in, in the paper, actually, you proved that on the upper bound side, you have something uh, uh, very precise. So you, you bound it by this thing plus this. And now I want to talk about it for a second that you should think about this as an error term. Okay? And the idea is just that uh, you know, in most interesting families of graphs, the cover time will be asymptotically larger than the hitting time. Okay. So only basically in sort of like one-dimensional examples do you have that the cover time and hitting time are on the same order. Okay. And so whenever the whenever you have a sequence of graphs where the cover time is uh, is is asymptotically larger than the hitting time, meaning that you know the cover time is less interesting if the only if the reason it takes you a long time to cover the graph is just because it takes you a long time to get from one vertex to another. So uh, you know sort of. In most families of graphs, the reason it takes a long time to cover is not just because it takes you a long time to go between two fixed vertices. Okay, there's something more complicated going on. So if that's, if that's the case, then, uh, then this, this is a little of one term with respect to the cover time. Right. So, the, okay, so, then you should, so this is a term which is for, you know, in some sense, in the regime where the cover time is interesting. So it's, it's actually the regime where the cover time is, is concentrated. Uh, sort of, uh, then uh, this, this goes to zero. So this is a little of one. And, uh, and, uh, and Gian, a couple of years after, maybe just a year later, uh, proved that actually for a wide class of graphs, you can match this, uh, this upper bound. So for bounded degree graphs and trees, uh, you, can, you, can, you can sort of get a matching uh, lower bound, but now where this constant C depends on the degree, the maximum degree in the graph. Okay, so this is, uh, this is really very nice. And, uh, and then this year, actually, uh, Alex Jai, a student at Stanford, showed that uh, you don't have to pay something depending on the degree. It's just the case that for every graph, uh, the cover time and this quantity are within sort of this uh, error term. Okay. So something which goes, you know, again, for, for interesting families of graphs, when the cover time is an interesting phenomenon, it goes to zero as the, as the size of the graph goes to infinity. Still, this error term is it real or is it uh, artificial analysis? No, the, the error term is real. Um, I actually forgot who, uh, this, this occurs in a paper of, I guess, uh, uh, Zetuni and, and Jean, Ofer and Jean. I mean, in, in particular, they do a calculation where the, the second order asymptotics are really different. So it's, uh, that's real. Which kind of makes it even more interesting phenomenon. And that's really like, does the error term actually scale pretty much like that? Or is that a cruder estimate? Uh, in a specific, there's a specific family of graphs in which the error term does scale exactly like this. What is this? What was the enlightenment? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is this example of a graph where this exactly the exponent? Uh, okay, good question. Uh, I, I, you've all they do just even, young, even for a tree. Yeah. De definitely on the on the on the two dimensional yeah, grid they they do this on the torus. What happens for the second order for 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 deregular trees? Do you remember? There you also get it, it should, I mean, there's, it should be the same as the, the yeah. torus. So, uh, okay. So it should be the case that even for yeah for deregular tree, you get the you get the second order uh, difference. Okay. Okay. So good. So now at this point in time, that's what this is what you should ask. Okay. So what is what what is this? Uh, Sorry, interrupted yeah. last time. But you like, can ask, like, you know. do you have uh, do you have examples of a graph in which the second order term is comparable? 
no, you really, it's really like it's really the bad case for you. That, that really you get this. You can if, if you take a cycle, then the second then the second order term is comparable to the cover time. Okay, and it's already enough. And the problem is there, there you don't even have concentration of the cover time. The cover time is in some sense no longer a well-defined quantity. For instance, the, vert the vertex you start at starts to matter when you have uh, when uh, when the hitting time and the cover time are of the same order. Somehow, you know, the cover time it, it ceases to be sort of the you know it, it's a robust quantity as long as the cover time is asymptotically larger than the hitting times. When it's not, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, there it's not the starting point. But the ah, no, the starting point doesn't matter for the cycle, but for the you know for like a lollipop or something, you can oh, sure, you sure. can get the starting point to matter a lot. Okay. For this, for the cycle, it's just lack of concentration that you. I mean, it, the the point at which you cover is you know the expected value is since it's not concentrated, it somehow loses some of its meaning. <coughs> okay, I mean this is this is you know this is half satisfying explanation, but it's but this is really what happens from the but like I mean this is the real phenomenon so. Uh, okay, so now we wanted to say what is this uh, random sum? Okay, so this random sum is the Gaussian free field on the graph. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, so let's now define it just uh, from uh, first principles. You take a graph, you fix some vertex v0, this is where you ground the field, okay? Uh, and then the Gaussian free field is the unique centered Gaussian process, okay? Centered means that these are all going to be mean zero normal random variables. Gaussian process means that so these are jointly normal random variables, so every linear combination of them is again uh, has, is normally distributed. And uh, grounded at v0 just means that you, you just fix it somewhere, so g of v0 is equal to 0. And then the thing which specifies that, you know, it's a Gaussian process, so once you, once actually, yeah, so, so it's specified completely by its covariant, by the covariances. Okay, so now the covariances are given actually by the effective resistance uh, distance in the graph. So expected uh, GU minus GV squared is the effective resistance distance between them. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah. So by the, as I said earlier, by these results of uh, Spilman and Srivastava, you can actually you can actually construct vectors that approximately give you this uh, in near linear time. So the th that seems you can actually construct the, the, all the vectors. That seems surprising because uh, you know the the natural description of these things is as n vectors in an n-dimensional space, but since you know that Johnson Linden Strauss will move you to a log n dimensional space and preserve uh, your distances, then you, you can use this to find a succinct representation of the process, which is not going to be exactly the same, but we'll have you know, some 1 plus epsilon here. Which, but it, which is 1 plus epsilon is sufficient so that, for instance, the maximum value also doesn't change by more than 1 plus epsilon. Uh, okay, good. Here, there's another way to say this, which is in terms of, in terms of, sort, of sort of the. Uh, you know, the uh, kind of Gibbs measure, which is that uh, uh, the density of this process is, uh, is exactly sort of like, you know, the, the, the probability of seeing some configuration is inverse exponential in the energy of the configuration, right? So the configuration is trying to make uh, the random variables be close along edges, uh, but, you know. It's also just saying that its covariance matrix is the inverse Laplacian, right? Yes, that's the same thing. Uh, yeah, the covariance matrix is the inverse Laplacian. So, on a high level, you're taking the effective resistance embedding of the graph into high dimensional space, and then you're doing a perturbation by Gaussians, right? No, no, the, the, this is the effective resistance embedding. Uh, you you can. If you set all the G's to identically one or something like that. No, no, no. So, if you. No, no, you can, you can think of these. these, uh, these, these I, I've specified, specified them as random variables, but you can think about them just as vectors. You can think about them as, as vectors in an n-dimensional space. And then, uh, and, uh, and then it's exactly the effective resistance bedding. And the way you sample from the process is you just project on a random direction. And that will give you the realization of the, of the Gs. I mean, that's the algorithm, right? But well, no, well the, the, to sample from this process, you take the, you take the effective resistance bedding and you, you project on a, a random direction. That, that's the... But I'm saying that in, in the, the same thing. So every Gaussian process is, you know, on endpoints is, is, is exactly the same thing as an endpoint subset of Euclidean space. But you're right, it is it's the effective resistance embedding uh, of the graph. Uh, and, okay, so here, and here's one example. Uh, like if, you're, if you just take your graph to be a path and you ground it at the first vertex, then the Gaussian free field is just, uh, is just simple random, it's just trajectories of simple random walk. So here's our, here, these are many different samples from the Gaussian free field on a 10,000 node path. Okay. Uh, from this point, 
Yeah. So, it is not, uh, is it easy to see that this vector resistance satisfies the triangular inequality? Uh, no. It doesn't, from this formula, it's not easy. I mean, there's, there's no reason that, that expected GU minus GV squared, I mean, in general, it will not satisfy triangular inequality if you just give me a Gaussian process. This is a special kind of Gaussian process. Yeah, my question was, is it easy to see from the left hand side? No, no. It's, it's, it's still easiest to see from the right hand side that uh, it satisfies triangular inequality. I mean, it's, it's, it's easiest from the commute time of presentation. <laughs> that's the same, that's the same. Yeah, so I mean, the, the effective resistance is, is, uh, is up to a scaling by the number of edges in the graph, the same as the commute time between u and v. I guess that's the easiest way to see that it satisfies triangular inequality. Because the commute time, if you think about it, is obviously, uh, okay, you get it for free. Uh, but no, I, I don't, uh, I mean, yeah, so this representation doesn't give it to you because there are other Gaussian processes for which you don't have this sort of squared triangle inequality, triangle inequality for the squared distance, so. And uh, actually, I'm not sure about the other way. If you have a Gaussian process which is, which, 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 uh, for which the squared Euclidean distance does satisfy the triangle inequality, I don't know if it's an effective resistance. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. It's not. It's not. Do you know an example? Is it involve directed graphs? All right. Okay. Uh, okay. So now uh, I see. All right. We discussed it yesterday. <laughs> okay. So now we can restate what we said before in terms of this Gaussian free field. You take the graph G. You take the Gaussian free field. The cover time is is uh, equal to the expected maximum squared uh, up to this uh, error term. Okay. And uh, and here sort of the grounding of the field is gone because the expected maximum, it's easy to see, doesn't depend, since everything is mean zero, it doesn't depend on where you ground the field. So, okay. so it's what it's saying is that if you, if you want to sort of uh, uh, compute the cover time, one way to do it is to sample from the Gaussian free field. This is actually a Gaussian free field on a grid. It's actually grounded at the entire boundary of the grid. But, uh, and, then, and then you look at sort of the highest peak. And this gives, gives you the, you know, sort of these events, the highest peaks correspond to somehow to the time at which, the first time at which the graph is, uh, is covered. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and another interesting point is that, you know, uh, Raghu Mecca showed that you can actually, you know, you can deterministically, for instance, get a hold of this quantity uh, very accurately using some derandomization techniques. Okay, so, uh, so let's see. So now what's the, what, what should we do? Well, obviously now we should explain uh, uh, sort of why Gaussian processes are relevant here. Okay, so this requires this, uh, uh, Dinkin isomorphism theory, okay? This is just a book about the theory. Uh, okay, so first we need the definition of the local times. Uh, so before we had the discrete time random walk, now we'll switch to continuous time random walk. So it's the same as discrete time random walk, except that we just wait an exponential amount of time at the vertex before we, before we jump. The, the, the sequence of jumps is exactly the same as the discrete time walk. We're just, you know, we're just spending a random amount of time at a vertex before we move on. Okay, and then, uh, so now given a time t and a vertex v, the local time at v uh, is, is just, uh, I've written it here in words because I think it's easier that way, it's just the, t the total time spent at the vertex v up to time t normalized by the amount of time you would have expected to spend there in the stationary measure, which is proportional to the degree. Okay? So this is the, you know, the relative amount of time proportional to the amount of time you expected to spend at the node that you've, you've been at that node up to time t. So you, it's, uh, it corresponds to these colors in the, in the torus animation we had before. Okay, so, uh, so there's been a lot of work uh, doing interesting things with local times, work of Ray and Knight in the 60s, um, sort of studying uh, local times for Brownian motion. And then what we're going to do today is inspired by work of, uh, or see today, uh, is inspired by work of Dinkin, uh, where there's sort of a general connection between Markov processes and, 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 uh, and Gaussian fields. And in fact, okay, so what we're gonna, so what I'm gonna state now is what's called the generalized second Ray Knight theorem by uh, Eisenbaum, Caspi, Marcus, Rosen, and Xi, which is basically a, a generalization of, of some version of the Ray Knight theorem for Brownian motion, but to the setting of general Markov processes, in particular random walks on graphs. Okay, here we go. Okay. Uh, so, okay, so we, we fix the vertex V0, and uh, now we're gonna define this time. So what do we do? Uh, basically, we're gonna, instead of thinking about global time, we're gonna parameterize everything by the amount of time we spend at the node V0, okay? So, 
Uh, T of L is the first time, this is a random number, at which we've, we've, uh, we've, we've spent time L at V0. Okay. So we fix a node V0, we start doing random walk. T of L is the first time at which we've, we've actually been at V0 for time L. Uh, okay, and also let's, let's take the Gaussian free field on the graph uh, uh, rounded at V0. Okay, so now here's the isomorphism theorem. For every L, okay, the following holds. Okay, so, uh, so let's, let's take this a little slowly. We have two processes here, one on the left, one on the right. Both are, are random fields. Both are uh, n variate random variables, okay? With one variable for every, for every vertex. Uh, uh, I mean, the two sides are independent. It's like you should think about them as separate probability spaces. And also on this side, we have two things. We have a, we have a, a Gaussian and we have a local time. Those are also independent. Okay. So that's the, I didn't write, you know, the slide is, is already has enough words on it. Uh, but the, the, over here, for this random process, these two things are independent. Okay. And the claim is that for every L, if you look at the, you know, for, if you look at the field of local times plus some Gaussian squared perturbations, then, uh, then uh, that process is the same as the, a process which has no local times and just has Gaussians. So you, you shift the Gaussians and you square. Okay, and when we say same, we mean same in the very, very, very strong sense that these are identical in law. These are really the same processes, yeah. So should I be treating these, I'm trying to understand the set notation, as a distribution or as vectors? No, no, you, yeah, you should treat them, sorry, as n-dimensional vectors. Okay. So this is, a, this is a very strong statement. This is not saying that you sample one, this is really saying that, uh, well, actually they're the same statement, but uh, let's the, the joint distributions are the same. Yeah. So. Right, okay. Uh, yeah, so the, the joint law on, on Rn, if n is the number of nodes given by these two things, is, is precisely the same law. Not just, uh, you know, I mean, really the same. All right. Uh, and in here, I just, uh, you know, t here is t of l. I could have written t of l. I will actually in, in, a, in a few slides. Okay. So this is the, this is the isomorphism theorem. Uh, Sorry, miss, did you say that the walk is moving in continuous time? <coughs> yes. Uh, okay, so this is the appropriate reaction uh, to the theorem. Uh, and in fact, okay, so I, I put the book up earlier. There's an entire book written about these things by, um, uh, by uh, Marcus and Rosen. And uh, while one can prove these things in greater and greater generality, uh, even the book itself confesses that, that, that nobody really understands the proofs. Uh, so they say, you know, people ask us when we give talks, to, if, is there some intuitive explanation for why the isomorphism theorems hold? And they, you know, they say, well, this is a, a good research project for the interested reader. Okay. Uh, okay. So, and this will remain a mystery even at the end of the talk, yeah. So what's going on with V0? How does the laws change when V0 changes? Uh, V0 is just a matter of, uh, well, so, so uh, I mean, this side doesn't. Re this this side. I mean, you just you're just translating when you when you change v zero, right? You're just sort of moving. Uh, you know. Now over over on this side, the and the t changes on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other side changes more more drastically when you change v zero. Uh, you know, it's a little tricky because you know in the these are identical in law, but sort of if you take the coupling, which we'll do in a second. Uh, sort of that, that makes them the same, then of course these have different distributions, the two G copies of G on the different sides. So uh, you only get sort of one side of the, the translation for free. Uh, okay, uh, all right, that happened again, okay. Uh, okay, so just to understand this and, and how sort of amazing it is, let's just see what happens for a graph with a single edge. Okay. So we'll have a graph with one edge, has a node V0 and a node V. Uh, okay, so then, you know, the, this, uh, this equality of law is, is, uh, only has one interesting thing in it. It only has, only V is interesting. Uh, V0, obviously, at this, at this time, this is L for V0, and this is 0, and this is 0, so this side is also L. So one part of the law says that L equals L. That's not surprising to most of us. Uh, the only interesting thing is what the law says about, uh, about GV, okay? So just something about one random variable. Okay, so what's the distribution of GV? Well, the effective resistance between V0 and V is 1. Okay, so, so, so this GV is just a, just a normal 0, 1 random variable. Okay, so I'm just writing the right-hand side, uh, you know, for GV, it's just half a normal 0, 1 
shifted and then squared. That's the that's the right hand side. So what we're doing is we're just we're just seeing what the process what this theorem says for a single edge graph, and in that case there's only one interesting random variable on the right hand side. Okay, so on the left hand side we we put the same half x squared, uh, and then uh, okay then we need to write down sort of what is the what is the local time at v given that the local time at v zero uh, was l. Okay, and this is not so hard. Okay, so what this is is so when you start at v0, you do some number of excursions to v. Like you come to v for a while, you go back. You come to v for a while, you go back. Okay? So suppose m is the number of excursions. We'll specify m in a second. Then what's the time we spend at v? Well, just for every exper excursion, we spend an exponential amount of time with mean 1 there before we go back. So, okay. so, the, so the local time is a sum of iid exponentials. And there's this m, which we didn't specify yet, but the yi's are just iid exponentials. M is the number of excursions uh, that we make before we've accrued time L at V0. So it's the, also the amount of time we're spending at V0 exponentials. So the number of exponentials you need to sum to get to L is a Poisson with parameter L. Okay. So the, and, and all, of these, all of these random variables here are independent. So, so even for the one edge case, the isomorphism theorem gives you the following fact, uh, which is due to Pittman much earlier, uh, that if I take a normal, if I take any value L, take a normal random variable, shift it, and square it, uh, then uh, it has the same law as sort of the, you know, uh, half the normal squared plus an IID uh, Poisson, a, a, a Poisson sum of IID exponentials. Okay. And, uh, okay, even to prove this is, uh, uh, I guess it's an exercise in your whole book. Uh, but uh, actually, there's, there's, there's also no known uh, way to prove this uh, that doesn't just compute either the densities of both sides or compute the moment generating functions of both sides, and then you just see that they're equal. There's no, you know, it would be ama it would be great to give a coupling proof of this that really shows you why the two sides are equal because you can think about them as sort of, you know, doing some kind of correlated sampling between two related processes, but. There isn't one. I actually think this is a, this 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 was a, actually would say now that this is a, a bit of a red herring because I think that the correct way to prove the isomorphism theorem is to just take this fact on faith. This is like a fact about the world, and then uh, no, but and but then the fact that it leads to a law. I mean, this is a, this is already a remarkable fact, but it's not nearly as remarkable as the fact that a joint law on n things has the same you know joint law on, on some other n things, right? That this you know okay. Somehow, that's, this is much more remarkable, but okay, I don't know. Philosophically, I would say that uh, actually, I don't think that the right way to understand the proof of this thing is to first understand the, the proof of this really well. I, I can, if somebody's interested, they can ask afterwards why I say that. I was hoping I would have a, the next slide would be the, the would it be the theorem that explains it, but it didn't happen yet. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is, the, this is the, the full theorem again. And let me just say very briefly before I go on to tell you why this gives a, a, a proof, let me just say very briefly about how the, our, our original proof uh, went. Um, okay, so the point is that uh, uh, you, can, you, can, you can think about the cover time. Maybe it's not even necessary to write it down. You know, the cover time is the first... Uh, is the first t at which all the local times are bigger than zero, right? That's the that's the that's the first time we visit every node when all the local times are bigger than zero. Uh, so if you want to prove that the cover time is at most the expected maximum of this free field, uh, that's actually um, not so hard uh, because if you choose this free field so that the expected maximum is large enough, okay, then you can be assured that the right hand side is going to be large, okay? Like, uh, choose, choose this, this term to be like, you know, some small constant times the expected maximum. Then this side, the right-hand side will be, uh, uh, wait, what, this, that didn't make any sense. What do I want to say? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, I said, I just said it the wrong order. Choose this side to be the expected maximum, and then, no, sorry, choose this side to be sort of like greater than the expected maximum, okay? So that no GV can possibly get there, okay? Uh, the expected maximum of a Gaussian process is very concentrated. So if you choose this to be greater than the expected maximum, none of these things can possibly get there. So every term on the right-hand side would be positive. Okay? And if you choose it large enough, then you can just see that all of these are like noise terms. So everything here is positive. 
these are tiny, so all of these will be positive. Okay, this is the way you prove the cover time is at most the uh, expected maximum squared. Okay, that's, uh, uh, that's not so hard. The more difficult thing is to prove the, the lower bound. Uh, so to prove the lower bound, we want to say, okay, we go to some time, and if, it, if we didn't get to the cover time yet, no, sorry, if, that, if the time is smaller than the expected maximum squared, we want to say that one of these should be zero. So if you just look at this law, and your goal is to get one of the local times to be zero, I mean, what can you do? One thing you can do is you can try to you know, set it up so that the Gaussian field you know, gets some element very close to this value. Right? Like, you know, this is just like a, you know, somehow GV, you want to get some GV that's very close to this value. Then this side will have some very small value. And maybe if this side is small enough, you can argue that, uh, that it forces this to be zero. Okay? Uh, this is not meant to be understandable, just that sort of like, it makes sense that if you want something on this side to be small, you should try to get something on this side to be small. Uh, and so then we do a lot of technical work to try to analyze sort of second order properties of, of the maximum of Gaussian fields to say that if this is near the maximum, then actually you, you can get some point very close to it. So then you get something here which is very small, and then you get something small on the other side. That was, it's a technical proof, and, uh, and, and I'm not sure there's, at least from this perspective, much reason to read it anymore. Uh, okay, because, uh, because of this new proof of, uh, of Alex. Okay, so, so uh, uh, Gian made the following conjecture uh, in his paper, um, which is, uh, I mean, it looks similar. All the objects are the same as the isomorphism theorem. But it's, uh, okay, but it's, it's not the same. It's not quite the same. So on the, on the left-hand side, we still have all the local times, but now we take their square roots. And on the right-hand side, we have, you know, in some sense, you, you just take the square root of both sides of this thing. Uh, okay, but, uh, you know, you need to be careful not to take square root of a negative number or something. I mean, I don't, I don't know, but uh, no, no. So uh, uh, you take square root of both sides, and then you, you want sort of some kind of domination, okay? And this green thing here means stochastic domination. Yeah, yeah. 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 James, what Jan said, the point is not square root of a negative number, because you have positive. I, I said, I, I made a comment to myself that this was, a, this was not a but, but smart thing to say. But the point is, square root, you don't want to, to take, right, so... You cannot take square root of both sides, is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, of course, yeah. You cannot just, you cannot like just, uh, I mean, the first thing you try to do on day one is, is expand the square and then cancel off the half GV squared from both sides. But that's not, you're not allowed to do that with these things, so... Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Uh, so this, this is the conjecture, where this means, uh, this is stochastic domination. So it really means that there should be a coupling of these two processes, where the, um, okay, it doesn't, you know, okay, ignore that picture for now. A coupling of these two processes, where the left-hand side in this coupling always sits below the right-hand side. Okay, so it's sort of saying that there's a, that you can get the values here to, to dominate the values in the left-hand side. And this is really nice, because now, if you, want to get a, if you want to get something on this side to be zero, you just need to get some Gaussian to be smaller than minus square root 2L. You go from the problem of trying to get some Gaussian to be exactly a quantity, which is some second order thing that's very hard to control, to just trying to say that you get a Gaussian that's smaller than some height. Okay? So, you know, what it, what it would say is that if you, uh, if you, uh, so this green thing is supposed to, is a, is a, is a abstract inter, you know, picture of the Gaussian free field. It says that uh, if you sample from the Gaussian free field, and then you look at this line minus square root 2L, and you look at all of the GVs that fall below this line, then these precisely correspond to uncovered nodes of the graph. So there exists a coupling between the random walk and the Gaussian field, such that when you sample from the field, everything below the line minus square root 2L are uncovered sets of vertices in the graph. This is the conjecture. It's very audacious because Gian only proved it for trees, and uh, for trees the proof is is, is not so is, is pretty simple and and not at all generalizable. Okay, but Gian made the conjecture, and okay, and and, uh, and uh, Alex uh, solved the conjecture, and so now in the last five uh, to ten minutes, let me try to say how how you can uh, how you can prove this domination using, of course, the isomorphism theorem. So using the isomorphism theorem, you prove this domination. Uh, all right. Okay, uh, and I should mention that uh, Alex's work appeared slightly after, slash concurrently with, depending on how you measure time, uh, uh, a, a result of Lupu, which which does not sort of uh, which doesn't prove this, but the technique for proving it is in is in uh, is also in Lup, uh, Lupu's paper. Okay, so uh, what does Alex do? Okay, so you start with the graph, and now you, you want to have the Gaussian free field on the graph. Uh, so the first thing he does, which is, uh, 
you know, somehow the main step of the proof is, the, is that, yeah, okay, so, so you replace every edge of the graph by uh, an, an interval of length one. So you make the graph into a one-dimensional simplicial complex. Okay, so now it went from being a discrete set to now a continuous, a continuous object. And now instead of doing random walk on the graph, we're going to do Brownian motion on this continuous object. Okay, so so if, you, if you do Brownian motion here and you stop it at the vertices, then uh, what you see is exactly the continuous time random walk. Okay, so sort of the, if, we, if we ignore the fact that the edges now have uh, some life of their own, what we see at the vertices is just going to be the same thing. But the advantage here is now that when you look at the, the corresponding uh, Gaussian free field, so now the Gaussian free field is on this continuous object. Okay, it's, it's, so now the, okay, uh, so now the sort of the set of vertices is a is a continuous set. But uh, just from basic properties of Gaussian processes, this Gaussian free field is is continuous on this object. So it means that now the you know before they were the, the Gaussians were just values sitting up here. But now I claim that when you sample and you get a value for every point of the continuous graph, that uh, the resulting field is continuous. And this is going to be the key to the to the proof. Okay. Uh, so what you do is you take this continuous object, the Gaussian free field on the on the on the, on the the simplicial complex, and then you apply the you apply the isomorphism theorem to that. So the isomorphism theorem is quite general. It also works for you know for this kind of object. Uh, so now you get the same thing. I'm writing it the same way, but now you should, the point is that this, this, these these are are living on the on the continuous graph. Okay. Uh, okay. In the, sorry. In this transition, I did two things. I moved the graph over, and also uh, uh, I gave the thing on the left hand side a different name. So now this is GV hat, and this is GV. Just to so that it's clear that they're not the same thing. Okay, so now, uh, so now our goal is to use this for the continuous graph to prove this thing, uh, that we, this stochastic domination for the, uh, for the original set of vertices. And uh, I'm, I, I knew that I was gonna run out of room on the slide. So, uh, okay, so here's the whole proof. The proof is, like where we, the proof is not gonna take the next, uh, we'll go slowly and it will take the next two minutes. Okay. So the first thing you do is uh, these these two things are identical in law. So, and and on, on this side these two things are independent. So what you do is just take the coupling uh, between GV and GV hat that makes the two sides equal. Okay. So now we'll take a joint probability measure on the two sides such that these two processes are exactly equal. Okay. Uh, you know. And now the marginals of GV and GV hat are are, are Gaussian, but they could have some very complicated. Uh, uh, you know, dependencies between them. Uh, and then we define this function, so I'll just write it again here. So it's a function on the, on the continuous graph, uh, which is uh, gx, what's, I'm using plus here, minus gx hat. Okay. That's, the, that's the function. And now we just, here's, here are some properties of the function. Uh, the first thing is that I claim that the function is continuous, okay? And that's because of the thing we already said, that both of these uh, fields are almost surely continuous. So the f of x is almost surely continuous, okay? So f is, let's just, uh, f is continuous. Um, and, uh, and then the other important property is that if f of x equals zero, okay, what does that imply? So if, if this thing equals zero, it means that that this is equal to this, okay? So if you, so it means that the square of this is equal to the square of this thing, uh, which means that the corresponding local time is zero, because this term equals this term, and this is positive, so it has to be zero. So the claim is that if f of x equals zero, then uh, the corresponding local time is equal to zero. Okay. So that's the, okay. So now that's the, so look at this domination and see what we need to show. Uh, if, there's a, if there's a local time that's, n now we really want to show when I say domination, now that we've made them have the same law, we want to use this, exactly this law to get the domination. So now we really just want to show that every value here is at most the corresponding value there. And that's our goal, to show domination. If a value here is zero, then we're fine. We're in good shape. This side is positive, I mean it's not negative, so, so if, if something here is zero, we don't have to show anything. Okay? The only interesting thing is, when these things are not, for the non-zero things over here, are they dominated by this side? Okay. So let's just, uh, okay, so let's define u to be the set of uh, x's such that uh, fx is, uh, ah, sorry, that the local time, 
is bigger than zero. Okay. This, these are the set of things on the left-hand side that we need to worry about, because they're not trivially dominated by the right-hand side. Uh, and if you think about what we want to show here, uh, we want to show that uh, on this set, f is positive. Because if f is positive, it exactly says that, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, um, good. Uh, if f is positive, it exactly says that this is bigger than this. So uh, let's see, this is bigger than this. Uh, then you go to the isomorphism theorem. Yeah, yeah, you, down, down here. Uh, so this is bigger than this means that the means that the square root of the local time is uh, the one over ah okay so you uh, yeah okay you I mean it's, it's actually for some reason a little trickier than I thought you take square root of both sides and then use the fact that this is bigger than this uh, to get. Uh, uh, you know, to, to show that this is, you know, inside the square root, this is at most 1 over square root 2 times this. Basically, this, when you take the square root, you get a half of this thing. Uh, get a half of this thing. Okay, the halves are correct here. Let's see, sorry, one second. <coughs> I've done this like, uh, made, no, sort of three times now in my life at this exact point. Managed to confuse uh, confuse myself. Let's see. Uh, okay. We want to say that uh, that uh, if f is positive, then we when then we have uh, we have domination here. Put it like a star by, by this side. So here, uh, f x greater than zero uh, implies that we're okay. Okay, that's uh, we haven't verified this yet. We'll come back to it in a second. Uh, so okay, suppose we knew that when f x f x is bigger than zero, then we have the domination. Okay, this I know it's not a very convincing thing at this point, but the claim is that uh, the claim is that then we're done because. Uh, we have a set U, okay, uh, which is the things that are, have been visited so far. We know that V0 is in U. I mean, in particular, we started the walk at V0. And, uh, and we know that F of V0, if you, if you calculate what it is, uh, it's square root 2L, okay, which is bigger than 0. So now F at V0 is bigger than 0. We know that on this whole set, F cannot vanish, because if F vanishes, the local time is 0. So f is continuous, it can't vanish on the set, and it's bigger than zero at one point. So this implies that actually f is bigger than zero on the whole set. Uh, and this is where we use continuity. And now the only question is why was is star, is star true? And uh, uh, so let me, let me take this uh, in, the, in the coffee break, okay? And if you're watching online, I apologize, uh, it's an exercise. exercise. Just, just, just to say, the point is when you take square roots, the only problem you have to worry about is, when, is whether the right-hand side is negative, gv plus root tl is negative. Because if it's positive, then taking the square roots will, will work. And, and the fact that f is positive rules out the possibility that, um, that gv plus root tl is, is negative. Why, 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 did you, what's the, why is the last fact true, though? That's, why is F positive rule out the fact that this is negative? That, that, uh, that what's inside the, 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 what's inside the square root? Because then the, the identity. 
but then, then the identity can't work. Ah, then, then you would, then you would, then, then, okay, you're right. So, uh, um, I see. If they were, if they were both negative, then when you square, you'll get something larger than the right hand side. Okay. So we'll still leave it as an exercise for the interested reader, and uh, say that modulo that exercise, then, uh, then the proof is finished, and I, I'll stop there. <laughs> so that's the end. You guys can uh, clap if you want. <laughs> Okay, so in, in, the, in order to, to clarify this, I, I would, I mean, if you really want to understand it, you should just read, well, read section 3.1 of Alex's paper. Uh, because the point is that despite the fact that uh, I should have done it in two steps, and for some reason they decided to do it in one step, which makes it very confusing, the proof is very, very simple. And, and you really, I mean, the, the big conceptual thing that's being used here is the fact that f is continuous. And if you only saw f at the original vertices, this continuity is lost. Like you don't, I mean, uh, you can't say that just because it's positive somewhere uh, and it can't be zero that it, you know, it could still, yeah, you can't say that it, you know, that uh, it can't vanish just because of those two things. Let me see if I get this because this was, I realized, a, a point that I almost missed because I was worrying about how to prove the inequality you were proving there, which I, I, I now accept is probably just mechanical. Um, but right, you're saying the key point is by you're able to use, right. Once you have this continuous process, right. so, on so the you graph, control, you can suddenly you control where it's, that it can't vanish, and yes. but you don't control a priori that it can't be negative. But the continuity allows you to to show because at at the v zero it's positive. That's another another key point. But why is every point on the same side of the zero set as v zero? Good question. Why is this at connected? That's what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, it's obviously connected in the discrete time case. It's because it's just the things that were visited, you know, starting at v zero. The fact that it's connected, you know, so now all you really need is the fact that sort of the, you know, the occupation set of Brownian motion is connected. And this is not I, okay. This is true and not hard, but but non-trivial fact. So it's just the fact that if you look at the local time of Brownian motion, then you know, kind of normalized time you spend at the you node, that can't vanish inside the support. And this is not a trivial fact. This is known as Ray's theorem. And it's connected back to the local time, to uh, you know, the early version of the ray Knight theorem, which says that the local time itself is a square of in absolute value of a planar Brownian motion. So there is a non-trivial point there. So for those wondering what's going on, I mean, the, the question is basically, you know, can the Brownian motion manage to go from, you know, can, can the thing manage to go from here to here, but actually only spend time zero at an intermediate point? So, and the point is that, zero, so. yeah, I mean, you have to, you know, I mean, yeah, so can, so can some, in order for Brownian motion to spend a non-zero time there, it has to you know, actually you know, sit there for a second in some normalized sense. And the, the claim is just that, no, it's Brownian motion, so it can't just sort of like ballistically shoot over this thing and keep going. You know, when you zoom in, it, will, it's, it has lots of variation, so it will actually end up spending time there. But it's a good, very good question, yeah. After spending all this time worrying about your work on the high dimensional embedding of graphs, uh -huh. you know, all the, you know, ARB and all that, isn't there just a, an equivalent statement of all this stuff as high dimensional embeddings? And projections and stuff like that, because Gaussians are just projections, and so yes. aren't we just simply doing something like embedding using the this? Yeah. And then when you say it's continuous, it's because you want to look at continuous embeddings and reach count it all in some simple. <laughs> line, high dimensional the continuous right. fact is, is is also not trivial. The fact that it's the fact that the sample paths are continuous. Uh, well, if you're doing projections, I mean, clearly you can move around under, you know, what vector you're projecting it on and do continuous. No, 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 no. The, the projection, the, the sort of the projection could be, could be, uh, no, no. When you go to the continuous field, now you're in an infinite dimensional space. And the, the, con the, the projection could be unbounded, like, you, because uh, it could be that when you zoom in on this Brownian motion, it's going, you know, in all kinds of different directions. So that when you do this projection, you, you get some huge, yeah, you, you could get some huge projection. So it's not, it's not the case that, uh, from the projection standpoint, you see that it's, uh, it's continuous. And in fact, it's not continuous. I can give you sets of vectors in, in a infinite dimensional Hilbert space, which, for which the corresponding process is not sample path continuous. So they, they exist. 
I should like, say, I guess you, I, I, I basically, the, basically, I think the issue in what you're trying to do is that like these lines on that graph are not going to be actual lines once you do this as an objection. They're going to be like arbitrary paths, right? I don't know. But but get, but but to to con but say to but to answer yes to your statement, a different way of saying this is that if you want the cover time, take the effective resistance embedding, project onto a random direction, and take the diameter of the projection. Okay. That will be the also the cover time. So okay, much easier for you to think that way. But I, I mean, you know, I'm sorry, but but, but the proof. But I have to prove that way though. <laughs> you can't get the proof to go through proof. just doing that, exactly. or no one's seen but it. The, the only way we know how to prove it is with this this isomorphism theorem, which is. Uh, which is a mystery. So you really need this analytic, these analytic facts to make this, in, this, so this the continuity. No, no, you can you can prove quantitative versions of all those things. And in fact, that's that's what Alex does in the paper. <laughs> you, you uh, this is the, this qualitative proof. You can you can you can discretize it okay. and make it quantitative. How do the so, uh, so people who prove the isomorphism theorem prove it? Is it by moments? Yeah. Like you compute the moment generating function on both sides. Uh, on the left-hand side, since you have a, a local time, you end up with some kind of uh, Feynman-Katz formula. So you sum over all the paths, you know, and all the trajectories with appropriate uh, multipliers. Uh, you get something complicated. You get some binomial coefficients. On the right-hand side, uh, you get sort of uh, you get these moments of Gaussians. And if you if you think about sort of like this Wick product formula, moments of Gaussians involve uh, like when you take products of like uh, sums of Gaussians. <laughs> You know the sort of, uh, in some sense, the the odd degree terms go away because you get uh, by because they mean zero, and you're only left with even degree terms. You end up counting perfect matchings. Okay, so there's combinatorics on both sides. <laughs> that's the, I mean, that's the, and so if you and if you work through them, they're the same <laughs> combinatorics. Combinatorial fact about perfect matchings being in correspondence with something, or no, that, even that would be it would be nice if there was a way to think about the perfect matchings as somehow related to. Trajectories in the random walk. Okay, that is an interesting question. Thank you. Great, thanks.